All right, perfect. Uh, well, so we usually begin, and we'll start with a prayer in just a second, but as we wait for some of the attendees to go in, we usually have a little bit of an icebreaker question. So uh, I'm Christopher Sebastian. Welcome to all of our attendees. We'll get started formally here in just a second. But I I'm wondering what all of our attendees and panelists are reading right now. Uh, so Susanna, she was my literature student from last year. So I, I'm interested to see how you've continued it. Susanna, what are you reading right now? Put you on the spot. Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Um, I am currently reading This Present Paradise by Claire Dwyer. It's about oh, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, and it's really good. Fantastic. Oh, that is that is great. Uh, I should say, I'll start off myself. I am reading Till We Have Faces by C.S. Lewis, which is a great one. We're, we're reading it next week for, for uh, our lit class. I have uh, Mr. Camerata's daughter, Emma, actually. In, in section. Uh, Sam, what are you what are you reading right now? Um, I just got in the middle of um, Deep Work by Cal Newport. Oh, great book. It is amazing. Excellent I am book. blown away. Yeah, I finished um, Atomic Habits like a month ago. James Clear is fantastic. Yeah. Yep. And it just kind of like people started recommending this one and I was just like, ah, this is yeah, I'm trying to really like just focus my whole. <laughs> That's great. We did a lot of deep work um, sessions in my department after I read that. We need to get them up again, but everyone is remote. It's easier to do it when you're when you're in person together. But both those books are phenomenal. I've done a couple of seminars for our community on uh, atomic habits. Those are just there's a lot of great, cool. great features there. Yeah. Uh, Henry, how about you? Yeah, um, I actually. I'm inspired based on our conversation recently, Chris, to read Till We Have Faces again. Um, but then we were just we talking about it last night. We had an right. Exit 90 meeting, Henry and I. Right. Are, are in the right. Same but um, yeah, but um, I recently finished a book called The Power of Habit, which is very interesting on the psychology of habits, how they're how they're created, how they are broken. Um, it was very interesting. So. Yeah, I've, Steph has read that book, my wife. Um, I, oh, cool. I have not picked it up yet, but I've heard great things about it. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Joseph, how about yourself? Well, I'm getting some great ideas from everybody on the panel. Um, <laughs> right now, actually, I because of my job, I tend to read a lot of Supreme Court opinions. But um, on, my, on a personal level, I've been reading um, the second book of Jesus of Nazareth by uh, Ratzinger, um, oh, which is uh, Lent um, going into Easter. That is an excellent oh. That that's we're not talking about improving ourselves, and that's the most important way to improve ourselves. <laughs> we need need the power of grace. That is excellent. And Nick, last but certainly not least, anything fun? Um, the question assumes facts not yet in evidence. Um, <laughs> I can't read. Um, no, seriously. that's unfortunate. Oh yeah. man. <laughs> But hey, it could be a great power of perseverance story. A lawyer who does not know how to read. <laughs> um, I am uh, unfortunately reading more than one thing at the same time. Not unfortunately, but I am, as I do all the time, uh, consult St. Thomas. So uh -huh. continue to work through the Summa based on issues that come up in my life. And um, and, and like Joseph, I am reading the first volume of Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, it's not going to come through. <laughs> it's um, going to be your background. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and really, I, like I said, I don't really know how to read. So I listen to it audio. Mm. So, that's perfect. Yeah. That's great. I love, I love audio books too. Yeah. That's it, really nice. Yeah. Sometimes when I'm stuck in traffic, I'm like, I hope the traffic lasts a little longer so I can finish this book, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, we have to figure out a way to say like, well, it's not quite reading, but it's definitely consuming and you're getting the concepts. I'm sure some of our very wise students will come up with a distinction for us. I'm sure. But, but perfect. Well, th welcome. Um, I think we've got everybody and about 45 people here. So thank you guys so much for taking the time and joining with us today. I will introduce everybody. Uh, let's start off with a prayer first, and I will kick it over to Susanna. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. 
our mother divine grace pray for us in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen all right so we are continuing in our career webinar series today uh talking about law and business and we have uh four spectacular panelists here today. I'll start off with Mr. Nick Camerata, who is an MODG dad. Uh, his wife is a consultant. I believe you guys have three graduates from our program. Is that right? Uh, yeah. And you've been enrolled since 2001, which is around the same time that my family enrolled too, which is, it's, uh, we are the originals. Uh, you are a TSC graduate, I believe class of 84. Is that correct? Spectacular. Uh, he is the call. senior vice president and the general counsel for the California Building Industry Association. So we'll be talking a little bit about real estate uh, and, and the building industry here in California. Thank you so much for being with us today, Mr. Camerata. Second, we have Mr. Joseph Ganal, also an MODG dad, two graduates. Uh, he is the father of Matthew who spoke with us previously at our math and applied mathematics webinar from a few months ago. Uh, he is, is it right? He's at Notre Dame right now, double major physics and biochemistry. That's right. Excellent. Very impressive. And he was our class speaker from, uh, from a couple of years ago. Uh, if my internet is bugging out, I apologize. Our SEE decided to shut off our power at our office. So I am here on our not as robust home Wi-Fi. <laughs> Uh, but Mr. Ganal is a former professional cellist, and he changed careers midway through uh, and entered Notre Dame, the School of Law there. And he currently works as the Assistant General Counsel for the Office of Management and Budget in D.C., which is a component of the Executive Office of the President. Um, so we're going to have a really interesting conversation with him today. We next have on the business side, Mr. Henry Tyker, who is also a TAC grad. Henry, I was trying to remember, is it, are you class of 05? 06. 06, yes. okay, 06, yeah. perfect. One although year. I didn't, although I didn't formally go to Maj, I grew up within the Berkwist sphere of exactly. homeschool influence. Exactly. So, you're, so, you're, a, you're an alumnus by, by connection. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Uh, Mr. Teichert has his MBA from the Thunder, Thunderbird School of Global Management. He is currently the product marketing manager for Cisco and has a previous background at Salesforce. And finally, we have Miss Samantha Flanders, who will be speaking with us about small business. She is a TAC grad herself. Okay, Sam, I should know this. Are you, are you 2016? Uh, 2015. 2015. Oh, I believe we're back and forth between those. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great, fantastic. Um, so we, we briefly overlapped. Yeah. Uh, a good friend, sister of a couple of MDG teachers, actually, uh, Rachel uh, Turner, and I think your sister, Therese Flanders, yeah. still teaches for us. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and she is the founder and owner of Verso Alto Coffee Roasters. Uh, for the, And we'll get into that story in a little bit. Uh, we are subscribers of you ourselves. <laughs> excellent, excellent coffee. Excellent. All right. And I will toss it with that. Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, I will be in the background, but take it away, Susanna. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. To start off with Mr. Camerata and start talking about law a little bit, could you please tell us about your work experience within the field of law and your favorite part about your current job? Um, well, let me start with the last thing first. Um, my favorite part of the job is driving home to my family. <laughs> um, uh, and, and that's probably something we all share, but, um, you know, more seriously, I don't, I don't do what you might think of, uh, typically as an attorney, I'm, uh, almost never, I think I've been in court once in the last 25 years. Um, I do work with government or in some cases, in fact, in most cases against government, um, prepositions are important. And um, that means that I do a lot of public policy. I do uh, a lot of uh, bill drafting and negotiating. I used to be a lobbyist and we represent um, the home building industry in California, which hasn't been a friendly pay place to our industry for a long time. And um, I, I did start out actually working 
were a real estate development company. And what we did was um, get uh, permission to build housing on our land, um, a very long and difficult process in California. And <clears throat> it gets so complicated that I, um, I wound up um, going to law school only to learn the things that I didn't know about the process. And by happenstance, wound up being an attorney in a law firm for a while and then went to work for the Home Builders Association in 1995. Um, and we do also um, work with regulatory agencies, the legislature, the governor's office, um, and in the courts. Uh, and um, I guess I would say that the thing that I've, I've valued most about what I do is the ability to apply the education I received um, in college. And, and I, I would have received it had, I, had there been an MODG when I was growing up, um, but didn't have that. But I know that just really from the, um, the experience I have with my own children who are going through the program and the kinds of works that you read and the things that you study are very applicable to what I do on a daily basis. I had wanted to be a teacher, and I find myself now um, really educating people on things that they may not know about. And that's really how I see my role. That requires an understanding of the common good, and it requires an understanding of a whole lot of things that are outside of um, maybe my area of expertise, but realizing that in a society, we need, everybody has some legitimate interest. Every industry, every sector of society has a legitimate function. And um, trying to figure out where those limits go around each interest in society is what I have to deal with. That's such an interesting perspective. Thank you so much for sharing that. <clears throat> Um, Mr. Ganal, could you please tell us about the different kinds of jobs that you have done as well since attending law school, and maybe what the most rewarding aspect of working in the field of law is for you too? Sure, happy to talk about that. Um, I've had the opportunity to work in uh, two different branches of government. Right out of law school, um, I was a clerk at the Court of Federal Claims uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, and in, in that role, I was uh, assisting a judge um, in, in handling uh, litigation. Uh, all litigation in the Court of Federal Claims is litigation um, against the federal government. So every, every um, case we say has a, um, the United States on the other side of the V. Um, and so my interests um, in going to law school was to um, understand and help improve uh, relationship between the public and the private sector. And so the Court of Federal Claims was an opportunity to do that um, and um, to get an understanding of how the, uh, the judicial process works and the, 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 the role of the courts in our ordered system of liberty, I'd say. Um, and then uh, picking up on what Nick said, um, I find b both of the Court of Federal Claims and my subsequent experience it you know, the, the role of a lawyer um, is very often uh, very like the role of a teacher, um, whether you're working with your clients or even representing um, your clients in front of a judge, uh, you're teaching them um, to understand the facts and the law uh, from a pers particular perspective and being able to break things down and represent it to them in an understandable way is um, very much the role of a teacher. Um, so my background in music and music teaching was kind of helpful in that, in that extent. Um, after the Court of Federal Claims, I'll just jump ahead, was uh, I, I got a, um, a job as a trial attorney at the Department of Justice um, in the tax division, um, litigating um, tax cases, um, which is not as dry as it sounds because tax covers so many different aspects of um, life and society. Um, every case had its own particular subject matter. Um, and so um, 
well, everything related to tax in some way. There were all sorts of different topics um, that we would deal with. Um, I was there for a little over three years, and then um, um, and then I jumped over to um, the Office of General Counsel at um, OMB, Office of Management and Budget, where I am now. Um, and our role here, um, my particular role is uh, facilitating um, the process of the review and promulgation of uh, federal regulations. Um, because I'm not a subject matter expert, those, those folks uh, reside in the agencies. Um, our role is um, to kind of help the policymakers evaluate policies, what's legal, uh, what's not legal, uh, what the range of options are, what the consequences of those options are, um, the, the proper uh, procedures uh, for promulgating regulations that affect the American public. Um, so I was very blessed. Um, my, my whole goal in changing careers was actually to try and make a um, positive impact on um, the, the role of government in American society. And I, I somehow, by the uh, uh, finger of God, uh, managed to make my way up um, to a um, very influential role um, very early in my law career. And I'm, I'm very blessed in that regard. Um, I'd say the, um, um, there's a number of aspects of, of law that I find fulfilling. One um, is, um, the ability to help people resolve conflicts. Um, that was very often, you know, you think of a trial attorney as somebody who is like taking a position and, and advocating for one side. Um, well, the great thing about working at DOJ is you're not actually necessarily advocating for one side at all times. Very often you try to take an objective view and make sure that the government is actually taking the right position. Sometimes you tell your client um, you did it wrong. Um, sometimes you advocate for your client who's the, the IRS or the Treasury Department um, um, explain to the court why um, they're right uh, and this taxpayer in question is is wrong. Um, but a lot of it um, is trying to bring the two parties together to reach resolutions without having to litigate. Um, at, at OMB, my current job, um, there's a bit of that. Um, I actually serve kind of a, a role between the administration, the agencies, and various parties. Um, trying to um, uh, moderate conflicts, but also um, being kind of a problem solver. Um, somebody has a, an issue they want to deal with. Um, they want to find a way to do it um, that's um, legitimate, um, that's going to be, you know, most beneficial. And um, my role is often to try and find the, the, the legal um, path to allow that to happen um, and to counsel on the various options. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, my clients may or may not take my advice. They may um, take more or less risky legal options. And we always have my first job um, at the courts to fall back on um, because the, the courts will ultimately be the arbiters of whether the, uh, my clients made the right decisions. Um, and sometimes I'm happy um, that um, they follow my advice. And sometimes I'm happy that the court tells them that they didn't follow my advice and they made a mistake. So that's <laughs> kind of a fulfilling part of my job. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, to move more into business now, Mr. Tykert, would you please tell us about your decision to pursue a career in business after graduating from TAC? Um, and then about your experience working for Salesforce and Cisco? Yes, for sure. Um, and to tell you about that decision, I'll just back up a little bit. Um, so I mentioned earlier, I'd grown up nearby the Berkowitz. And so, um, you know, I was very fortunate to grow up near the Berkowitz and, you know, grew up with James and John Berkowitz. And so I often found myself at the Berkowitz house, um, seeking wisdom from Marcus and Laura Berkowitz. And I remember I was chatting with Mr. Berkowitz um, this would have been in the 90s, late 90s, and I was talking to him about professions and careers and what was worthwhile. And it was very interesting because, you know, we were discussing, like, what is work and what does it mean? What is vocation? What is work? How do you align all of that? And we kind of discussed the idea of the noble profession. So everyone today has heard from the noble profession of law, right? So law and I, I'm, the attorneys here can correct me or, um, you know, modify as they wish, but like 
law in general is a noble profession. It seeks the common good, you know, like protecting people's property, all these other things. And it is it is something that we absolutely need to function. And it and it brings it is for the ultimately the common good, right? Medicine for health, right? Um, teaching, teaching is is you know to instill knowledge to help the person come to a realization. So, the, like these are like inherently noble professions. So, I was having this discussion with Mr. Berkowitz, and I was at the end of the discussion, I was a little sad because I realized I didn't think my talents aligned with medicine or law or teaching or the religious life, right? And as we discussed this, I realized in my conversation with him, it wasn't that he was saying you have to be a lawyer or a doctor or a teacher. It was just that he was saying these are the most noble. And if you don't do these things, perhaps bring, figure out how to take your business or whatever you decide to do, how to make that noble uh, as a means to an end. So for example, um, business can be very noble if it is for the sake of providing for your family, or if it's for the sake of um, taking a, a good business. So for example, coffee is a great business. That's very noble because like it's helping everyone get through their day, right? So like, so the point is, is like, there's just a little more of a, I, I feel like there's a little more of a nuance with business because business in a certain sense is about getting money, right? Which is like, okay, so like, do we want to encourage greed? You know, like that's, that can't be the end. If the end is just to get money for the sake of the money, then that's, um, that is, that is not noble at all, right? So I'm, I'm saying all that because I decided when I wanted to do business that I wanted to, to be involved in a business where I could support my family, hopefully live in California, which is not the cheapest state, right? Um, so trying to find a business, some sort of business I could do where I could support my family in California. And then, and then of course, like if, if God has blessed someone generously in their profession to give back to others, right? To give back to nonprofits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so Chris, I'm doing your job for you. Uh, anyways, just kidding. Give, give to much. Uh, anyways, um, that was a joke. Anyways, um, so that was kind of my means to coming to business. And then at Thunderbird, I fell in love with marketing. Um, but especially, again, to think about the, the means to an end, like marketing that is true and good. So like, I didn't want to work for Coca-Cola, right? Because ultimately, I didn't want to realize, I didn't want to die and, you know, on my deathbed, think to myself, I helped people consume sugar water and get diabetes sooner, you know, like that just wasn't something I wanted to have on my conscience. Right. Um, and so I ended up going into tech um, through networking at school. And of course, tech is an interesting minefield of things. There's good tech. There's not so good tech. Um, so I'm very glad to be. Um, so I worked at a bunch of startups in San Francisco, including including Salesforce after they after they went public. And through that time, I began to realize like there really are companies that are doing good. And there are companies that perhaps they're doing good, but they can be there. Maybe their leadership can be a little morally questionable or other things. So it was just sort of, you know, a little bit of dodgeball trying to figure out what was I comfortable with in terms of finding that mean in between um, a good a, a good business that was doing good um, or at least morally neutral, and then providing for my family. So I ended up going to Cisco because um, I think we can all agree technology in terms of the internet is morally neutral. Obviously, it can be used for good. It can be used for bad. Um, but Cisco really provides like the infrastructure of the internet. And I work in a division in product marketing where we actually provide connectivity for power utilities so that if the power goes out, they can redirect the power quickly. Um, which I think we can all agree we'd like to keep the electricity on. Um, we provide security software for the U.S. government um, to keep, you know, to keep them from getting hacked, which I think we can all agree is a good thing. So, so I'm happy to be in a in a role in a company now where I feel like we're doing good things. Um, so, so, so to sum it up, um, thinking about what what is your what what is your profession? How will it be used for good? Um, how does it provide for your family? And then also, is it something you're passionate about? Is it something you're interested in? Um, so I love technology. So, so doing marketing for technology is a lot of fun. So that's my, that's my sh short answer. <laughs> no, thank you so much for sharing that. That's a really nice perspective to look at as we're all trying to decide like what we're <laughs> going to continue after high school. So thank you for that. Sure.
Um, last but certainly not least, Ms. Slanders, as the founder of Versa Well to Coffee Roasters, could you tell us why you decided to start this business and what a typical work day would look like for you? Yes. Um, so I think it kind of goes along with uh, what Henry is saying is find something you're passionate about. Because um, I think that we all know that quote, like, um, if you are who you meant to be, you'll set the word on, world on fire. And I think that's just like, it's just really true. It's like we're each sort of meant to be different members of Christ's body, and we we fulfill different missions um, as the saints that we're trying to be. Um, and yeah, it was just interesting. I had never thought when I went to TAC that I would be a coffee roaster. <laughs> um, I had always been interested in nursing and um, going into medicine. Uh, but my thesis advisor at Thomas Queen's College, um, Jared Kubler, he is a home roaster and he's, he's sort of what spurred the whole idea. Um, he would have students down and do coffee tastings with them. And on multiple occasions, uh, he would just um, have me down and he would show me how to roast on his roaster. And I was just really intrigued by that because my family always loved um, drinking coffee and kind of sharing the coffee moment together. We've kind of coined that term because um, when my parents started taking us kids to daily mass, we'd come home um, and always have coffee together. And so we ended up calling it the coffee moment. We'd be like, okay, coffee moment time. And then that's kind of where the whole thing started. So it really started back at home, um, building this little community around a cup of coffee. And then uh, when I was at TAC, I was just like, oh, wow, like, I never realized there was so much art behind coffee. And it's just similar to kind of anything like wine tasting or whatever, you know, you can find nuances in it. And, um, and then when I ended, when I finished at TAC, um, I moved in with my sister in Northern California and we started just home roasting together. I was like, whenever I end up somewhere, I just want to start roasting. So I started on a popcorn machine, which is the simplest way to do it. Um, you can do like four ounces at a time. And we started giving it away as gifts. And so many people kept asking, can we buy this? Like, we really love it. And so we were like, let's, let's, let's just take this <laughs> and make a business out of it. Um, so we ended up buying a, right now I have a um, 700 pound roaster. So we can, the match max batch we can roast is three and a half pounds at a time. But um, the roaster itself is like pure steel. Um, it kind of looks like a Willy Wonka-esque <laughs> machine. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I think it's important to find something you're passionate about and then your job becomes a lifestyle. And yeah, you really enjoy what you do while you're working. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. That's such a unique story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see, jumping back um, to law a little bit, Mr. Camerata, I know you said that the field of law that you're in is a little bit different than what people generally think of when they think of law. Um, but could you tell us a little bit maybe about like the other types of law that you've come into contact with and why you chose the specific field that you did? Sorry, didn't realize I had muted myself. Um, um, you know, it, um, the other types of law that I come into contact with can be almost anything um, because uh, I'm working in politics where they're arranging all the parts of society. But I think I would say this, that I most commonly come in contact with environmental laws, uh, land use laws, um, court liability. Uh, this is where you, somebody causes property damage or personal injury, um, contract law, um, deciding what you can put in a contract and what you cannot put in a contract. Um, and, and labor law, um, which regulates things like working conditions, wages, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Um, there's many other things, but I think those are the big ones that we typically have to deal with. Um, 
you know, I would say how I wound up here was really not, there are some people I know who in eighth grade, they knew exactly what they wanted to do. And today in their sixties, that's what is their, what they're doing. And they've always done that. I was not like that. Um, I, I, uh, I, I grew up in a, in a family that was involved in, in real estate development and building mostly shopping centers and, and land development. And then we did some home building. And as I mentioned before, it was, it was not really a planned thing. And um, I, I wound up going to law school expecting never to be a lawyer, never to use it, which, you know, um, I had been educated to think that, you know, you, you pursue knowledge for its own sake. Um, and, and, and silly me, it was actually trying to do that. And, and the, the problem with that is that law school is very expensive. So I don't recommend necessarily that people do that if, if they're not going to use a law degree to, to earn enough money to pay back your debts and, and support a family. But I have seen many other people with law degrees that are, you know, don't wind up practicing law, but doing very well in their careers. Um, some knowledge of the law, I think, is probably important no matter what field you're in. Um, but I, I, lots of very successful people um, in many unrelated fields. It's for sort of a good maybe background. Um, in a practical world, uh, if you're doing that kind of thing, that it, it's worth having. I mean, there have been obviously saints that are lawyers. Um, there have been great theological um, writers who are lawyers, um, great economics uh, economists <clears throat> that were lawyers and priests. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not, I haven't found it to be really a limiting career. No, thank you so much for sharing that. That's really good to know. Mr. Canal, I know you had mentioned this a little bit earlier, but you were formerly a professional cellist before you went to law school. Um, could you tell us a bit about the transition between these two careers? Like, is there anything you wish you had done differently or anything that you definitely do again? Um, I would definitely do it all again. Um, I think um, looking back retrospectively, it's 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 been a, a great journey. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was a cellist and a teacher. Um, so performing, teaching, these are kinds of things that lead naturally or, or assist naturally in the practice of law. Um, being able to stand up in front of people um, and make a convincing um, you know, performance um, and also to teach them something along the way. Um, but um, I would I would not recommend doing it with four kids, um, which is what I did. Um, and um, and, you know, I have to say that um, I am so happy that I am where I am now. Back at the beginning, if I'd known how difficult it had been then I probably wouldn't have done it. So this is one of those cases where God kind of leads you in a certain direction, gives you a little bit of a push, doesn't give you all the information that you'd like, um, but he, he knows what's good for you. Um, and, then, um, and then you struggle through it um, and uh, you come out the other side and you're like, hey, God, you were right. Um, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done this if I had known uh, all this, read all the small print up ahead, but uh, um, no, it's um, been a great experience. Um, I'd say I wish I had um, been more attentive in my um, history classes um, because there is so much of law that's rooted in our history um, and the way our um, um, system has developed is very much dependent on where we came from. And um, Probably, I would say the problems in the law in the world today are uh, stem from a failure to um, attend to our roots and to have an understanding of where we came from and where we're going. Um, and so I would encourage anybody who's at all interested in the study of law to steep yourself in history. 
Thank you so much for sharing that. That's really good to know and definitely something that we can apply <laughs> in our daily lives. So thank you. Um, going back to business now, Mr. Tiger, I know you talked a little bit about this earlier as well, but could you tell us about the different sorts of jobs which are open to those who wish to go into the field of business and then why you chose the type that you did? I know you did cover that a bit too, though. So. Oh, for sure. Um, I would say the, 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 the field of business is a very, is a vast world, you know, there's, um, so there's lots of different types out there. Um, so, you know, formal, in, in the formal definitions, there's finance. Um, so it's all, all of the money and cents behind the business, um, which is crucial. There's, um, depend and, and there's different groups depending on the, um, the business. So, but I'll, also I'll speak about this from a technology perspective since I've been in tech. So, um, in the tech sector of business, there's finance, which is crucial. Um, there's engineering, which is building and designing the product. Um, there's the product management team, the product managers, <clears throat> they're like the CEOs of their products. So if you think about everyone here probably, you know, has a parent who has an iPhone or wishes their parents had an iPhone. So everyone here, I'm sure is very familiar with iPhones. So the product manager of the iPhone at Apple, like they're responsible for everything about the iPhone from every last feature that's built in the iPhone to working with another crucial part in tech hardware supply chain. So supply chain would be responsible for sourcing the parts um, and building the parts. Um, so, um, you know, that's something for someone who's very organized um, and is very like future focused. Um, supply chain is a really interesting uh, part of the business world. Um, and then of course there is um, HR, uh, human resources, uh, making sure that uh, the employees are happy, doing well, making sure that everyone's productive, making sure that there's, you know, adequate benefits for the employees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then of course, uh, protecting the, the company as well. Um, but that's, that's a much bigger conversation probably we can have right now. And of course, there's the legal counsel, right? So you've got lawyers in a business, right? So you have to have the legal counsel in a business. Um, and then, um, of course, there's marketing. So I love marketing because so much of what we do in our lives is selling. So much of what we do is is telling a story that that shows people the beauty of something. Um, and so I like marketing because it is taking what a technology company does, namely Cisco, and it's wrapping it around what the customer cares about. So perhaps the customer um, is, you know, SoCal Edison, and they care about getting their power back on within 60 seconds after it goes out and being able to reroute electricity from another place, right? So we can talk to SoCal Edison about how our solutions improve grid stability, improve the power grid's reliability. Um, and then we could go all into that. But the, the point is, is like, I like what I do because um, I'm helping a customer realize um, the good that this company can bring for them. Um, so yeah, so that's why I chose marketing. And um, there are many different kinds of marketing. So I'm not, I don't want to confuse everyone. I'm um, in product marketing. I work like very closely with the engineering team, which I think in tech is really good because in the technology sphere, engineering is very, very powerful, right? The engineers are the ones who build the products, right? So if you look at companies like Google, if you look at companies um, like Meta, if you look at other big tech companies, you know, like SAP, Oracle, the engineers really run the show at those companies. And so, um, so working in product marketing is good because I'm able to work closely with the engineers. Um, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's my quick uh, answer. No, thank you so much for sharing that and explaining that to everyone. Um, Ms. Flanders, could you tell us, I mean, again, talked about this a little bit earlier too, but about like the mission of Versalato Coffee Roasters and how the Catholic faith plays a role in your business? Yeah, so um, I was, when I was trying to figure out a name for the business, I was wanting to sort of lead people in a um, sort of covered Catholic way. Like I don't want to scare the pagans away. Um, but we definitely wanted something that would like bring people towards the faith. And I'd been thinking a lot about um, back in 2015, I did the Camino de Santiago. 
And I had been kind of thinking like, oh, I want something that's just like maybe pilgrim roasters or, you know, like the way, um, which is like sort of has a mission statement behind it, but it's just not like overtly Catholic. And then um, I was just praying and praying about it and just kind of thinking about it. And all of a sudden I was just like, what about verse Lalta? This was like probably three, three or four years ago um, before Pier Giorgio became kind of the big figure he is now. Um, but I had always had this very quiet devotion to him. Um, back in 2017, I was on my way to work at a winery in Washington state. And I had stopped over at some friend's house and they, um, on my pillow, this is the first time I'd ever heard of Pier Giorgio, but the mom had put his prayer card on my pillow. And so the next morning over breakfast, um, over a cup of coffee, we, I was just like, who's Pier Giorgio? I've never heard of him. And she kind of explained a story to me. And ever since then, I've had this very quiet, growing devotion to him. And I love the outdoors. I love nature. And um, I really find God when I'm in the mountains or like hiking or just seeing just the natural beauty. And so um, when we were thinking of a name, like I was just like, oh, verse Lotto, like I love it. It's Italian. It's um, he was just like so deeply embedded in nature and loved to bring people to God and um, was very much like John Bosco or Dominic Savio kind of like, hey, if we go, if I win the skiing tournament, let's all go, you know, do adoration or he also was a big, um, he liked to play um, trying to think polo games and it was just, yeah. I don't know, just kind of like thinking about how how often he brought people to God just in living his life. Um, so we kind of adopted that name for our roastery, um, Versalto Coffee. And yeah, we kind of just like to lead people to God through that name. So <laughs> that is so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, for the last little bit of our um, questions here before we move on to the Q&A pod, I just wanted to ask if um, any of the panelists had advice for students who wanted to pursue a career in um, their kind of field as well. So starting with Mr. Camerata, do you have any advice for students who are interested in law? Um, oddly enough, I would say that um, MODG is a good preparation for law. I would say that Thomas Aquinas College is a good preparation for law. I'm not saying that there's no other, um, but um, lot, the logic works uh, that we study in Aristotle and in other writers is, I think, is important. Um, philosophy has been very helpful in that area. I, you may know that Aristotle has written a lot on politics and ethics, um, both of which come into play there. At, at this point, the education is really important in, in those areas. And of course, St. Thomas, who um, I know you do a little reading of uh, on the law. And, and that is something I, I come back to. And the funny thing is, is that in that education, you will know things that nobody, I won't say nobody, but most almost no one knows who is practicing law and they wish they had known it. Um, and, and so you have an advantage over them. And I would say this generally about MODG and liberal arts education period is it's not that, you know, it's worthless. In fact, society doesn't even know that these are the answers that they're looking for. And that gives you a tremendous advantage in anything you are pursuing, whether it's law or otherwise. I mean, other than that, specifically about law, I'd just say, talk to people who are practicing law, um, go with them to work for a day, you know, see if that's something you would really like. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's really inspiring and definitely really helpful advice. So thank you. Um, Mr. Ganal, do you have anything to add with that for anyone interested in law? Yeah, I would, I would double down on everything he just said. Um, and I mentioned earlier uh, the importance of steeping yourself in history, but also something that was very useful to me coming to law school later on uh, with a family. 
um, I found that just breadth of life experience is very useful because the law is about solving real problems that people have and conflicts that people have. And the more background you have in, in life um, and experience you have, um, the more you can understand the way the law is working and how it how it's come up with solutions and how those solutions can be fit or uh, or problematic um, depending on the perspective and and how uh, you might want to um, understand and and move um, the law uh, appropriately. Um, just a, a wealth of experience. I would say I wouldn't recommend anybody to rush into law school. Um, right after undergrad, there's some people who are just like dead set. They know that's their area and there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but I think it's great and very beneficial to get some real life experience before you jump into law school. Thank you so much. That's really helpful as well. Thank you. Let's see, jumping back to business, Mr. Tiger, do you have any advice for those who are interested in business? Yes, I do. Um, so sort of echoing what was said, don't be afraid to talk to people who are doing a job that you think you might like. Don't be afraid to go find a friend who you can, uh, you know, shadow them for a day, a friend of your, a friend of your parents, or, you know, maybe a cousin's friend, you know, just don't be afraid to network and ask. People want to help. Generally speaking, people really want to help. Um, some advice someone once gave me, you know, LinkedIn is a great tool um for connecting with people um and most people you know even if they can't meet for you know for a cup of coffee for 20 minutes they might be happy to have a 10 minute phone call if you see on linkedin someone who's working in a field of business that you're interested in and perhaps they have some connection to a family member or somebody um don't be afraid to ping them and just say hey could we just chat for 10 minutes i'd love to learn more about your job sort of like this panel but you can just call them and and have a you know one-on-one -on -one conversation with them so don't be afraid to ask is uh, one big thing. And then also don't be afraid to be wrong. Don't be afraid to try things and change. Um, you know, you can, you know, for example, um, I, I worked uh, when I was in college at Thomas Aquinas College, I did a summer internship twice with a law firm doing insurance law. Um, and that was really interesting to me at the time. I was in college, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I figured out that wasn't where my talents lie. Um, but I wasn't sure back then whether, you know, I wanted to be a lawyer or be in business. Um, so don't be afraid to try things and evolve. Like you don't have to have all the answers now. Just, just take your first step. Don't be afraid to take a step. And I think, I think, and I say that as someone who went to a you know, liberal arts school where, you know, we really are focused on critical thinking. I think that, that one mistake that I made and some of my friends who have a liberal arts background made is they kind of think. There, there can be this temptation that the certitude with which you can pursue philosophy or mathematics, I need that, or, or theology, that certitude I have studying math, I would like to have that in my career progression, or I would like to have that in my future decisions. And we can't have that. We have to be comfortable with a little bit of ambiguity, um, and we have to be comfortable just trusting in God and taking the next step. Um, so that's what I would say. Thank you so much. That's all really good to keep in mind. Thank you. See, and last but certainly not least, again, Ms. Flanders, do you have any tips for students who are interested in starting or working at a small business? Yeah, I would just reaffirm what Mr. Teichert said is um, finding someone to coach you along the way. I think doing a trade in our in our culture these days is really rare. And I think that um, it shouldn't be rare. It should be, that's sort of the norm was being, having a mentor and following that mentor for years. Um, I know in my own experience, when I was looking into buying this massive roaster, I was scared to death. And so I ended up reaching out to probably 10 different roasters in our community and just kept reaching out and reaching out. And finally, one of them emailed me back and was like, oh yeah, just come on up and I'll just coach you and show you whatever you want to know. And so I ended up um, doing several like almost three months worth of just coaching with him. I'd come up and he trained me on his roaster and it was just so wonderful. It was like, he was so open to just sharing everything with me and like sharing the art and the hobby behind it and kind of weaving all of that into a lifestyle and, and just making me really um, 
comfortable with using a roaster. And that was invaluable experience to me. It's not something that I could have learned just, you know, just from, you know, watching YouTube videos or something like that. Hands-on experience is so important. And it really instilled in me like confidence and also just like the joy of doing what I do now. And I think it, that's just the best experience you can get is hands-on. So. Thank you so much. That's really good advice. And thank you all so much for coming and doing this today. I'm going to toss it over to Mr. Sebastian for the Q&A, but thank you again. Thank you all so much. Uh, really invaluable advice, as you can see from our, our chat. A lot of people are hearing things they've never heard before, which is uh, beautiful and wonderful. I apologize. My internet has been very unstable for a little bit. I think I heard everything. Um, I'll start, we'll start off with Ms. Flanders this time. We've got a couple of questions coming in. So, uh, Sam, what would you recommend? How would you say is the best way for a small business owner to really get your product out there? How do you, how do you promote? Um, the biggest thing that we've experienced is working with our community that we've been in. Um, so when I lived up in San Jose, uh, we started doing these makers markets and we had this little program going where um, I would sell these re refillable, um, we call them growler jars, kind of like you refill your growler jars, beers um, at breweries, but we would refill them at the markets with coffee beans. And we start, we opened this little, um, you know, those little library lend books that neighborhoods have. So I made one for a coffee stand. So people would put their jar in and on the internet, they would like put in what kind of beans they wanted and like pay for it. And then I would just refill it and they could come pick it up whenever. So it was our little library coffee jar. Awesome. <laughs> um, book lender. But that was, I get, like the, the relationships I formed through that maker's market and the little community we founded around like in our neighborhood. Um, I moved away from there a year ago and moved down to Santa Barbara last year and I still, those, those customers, even though we don't live in that neighborhood anymore, they are still like regular orderers and they, they still, you know, comment on our blog posts or like write on our Instagram, like we miss you or things like that. And it's just kind of like, I think it's really important to just wherever you're, wherever you're at to build community around that, at least for my business. I mean, our business is very small. It's very, um, very particular, uh, but it's been super helpful to have that um, and to just to kind of grow where you're at. So, yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, community is so important. And I know that at all the, uh, some of the alumni events at TAC, you do your pour over bars too. And that is always a big hit. There's always a, a flock of people around there. <laughs> Which is awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Sam. That's that's great. We'll, yeah. we'll keep, keep ordering our coffee. <laughs> um, a question for, for both Mr. Ganal and Mr. Camerata about networking. So uh, Ella, Ella Rose, ER, who is in our section with Emma, uh, Nick's daughter, Emma, asks, I know that networking is very important as a student pursuing law. How did you network as an undergrad and would you do any of that differently? Did you find that by attending a smaller school, you had difficulty doing that? Not necessarily the case for you, Joseph. <laughs> Notre Dame is pretty big. Uh, in law school, how did you find your specific area? So let's, I think, focus in on the on the networking part. What advice for networking would you give? And is there any benefit to, uh, if you're at a smaller school, how would you overcome the, the lack of a network, if you will? Um, I guess I would say that networking is, uh, is very, very important. And um, I, I feel bad about saying that, but it, it's just one of the things. And I would say networking in terms of getting a job or in terms of advancing and moving on from a job to something else, because you become very well known for your talents and your skills. Um, the, the fact that I went to a small school really wasn't that much of an obstacle to me. And I say that simply because law school is a graduate school. I mean, I guess what I, if you're thinking Thomas Aquinas College, for example, it is a small school, but I didn't go right from there into law. Um, and my, my law school classmates, one of them actually wound up hiring me. Um, so 
uh, don't be, I would say this generally in the law or outside of the law, some, some people feel like it's not a good thing to rely on who you know to get a job. And I just want you to know that as when we hire, we value the insider's knowledge of the person way more than, because I can't tell you how many times you look at a resume, people look good on a resume or they interview well, but they don't turn out to be a good fit for your company. And so I, I yes, 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 network. Anything to add to uh, that, Joseph? Yeah, I'll just say I'm not, I'm not a networker by nature. Um, undergrad, I was studying music. Uh, my network was like the people I played music with, you know, um, uh, various, I studied various things. And so my networks were like kind of the people I knew in those, those areas. Um, I'll, I'll say that um, every, every opportunity I've had uh, in, in law has come through a contact. Um, I, I honestly don't think I ever got a callback or an offer from a place where I didn't know anybody um, because, you know, knowing the person is very different than looking at the paper and meeting them once in an interview, like, like Nick said. Um, but I would say that because of that, the value of networking is, is building friendships, mm. um, not just building a list of contacts. Um, because it, it's, it's the personal relationships that, that, that um, are valuable um, in advancing your career and not taking it from the perspective of what am I going to get out of this relationship. But, um, you know, um, I actually went to a panel uh, in D.C. last night. A bunch of Catholics were talking about networking in the law um, and they were, you know, they emphasized, I'll just cheat from them. They, they were saying, you know, you have to think about it in, in a Christ centered way. Um, you know, when you're building relationships with people, what is your purpose in this relationship? Is it, is it you know, is it, um, you know, something, um, you know, secular, um, just plain, is it a, is it a base um, um, purpose or is it because you and the other person, um, you know, can help each other in ways um, that are more meaningful? Um, you build relationships, you build friendships, you build virtue, you build, um, the, the, together a, a path to reach um, heaven. Um, and so keeping that in mind that, you know, you, you should um, build relationships based on Christ and on what you um, can bring to the relationship, not just on what you're going to get from a relationship. Mm, that's powerful. As a lot of our students know, we talk about the different times, types of Aristotelian friendship, not just friendship of utility, but there can be some good utility in there. And Providing somebody with a job as what Mr. Teicher was talking about before, providing for your family is a, is a worthwhile endeavor and um, providing, doing good work is a, is a very worthwhile thing. Thank you so much for that. Um, and so we'll round it off. Uh, Mr. Mr. Teicher, I have to ask you something. I can't ask all three other three panelists. Uh, so earlier, a, a, um, a uh, participant was asking, how do you handle the tough days at work? This is just kind of an advice thing, because we know that even if you are in an area of work that you love, that you're passionate about as you are, we know that there are tough days. Um, so how would you recommend our students when they get into the workforce? How do they handle that? How do they compartmentalize? I know that for Mr. Camerata, he'll drive as fast as he can on the way home to work. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but how would you recommend that they handle the tough days? Well, I think, um, I mean, I think a big way to handle the tough days is obviously, you know, the, the Catholic notion of suffering. We're all called to suffer. We're all called. So, I mean, I'll give you a, a very Catholic answer first. Like we're all called in this world to suffer um, and to unite ourselves to Christ. So I think that, um, you know, part of being in the world, but not being of the world is, you know, we'll have those, those moments of suffering. And so that can be your offering, like St. Therese, the little way, right? Like, like you can offer up that bad day at work as a prayer, right? So I think that's, you know, that's one thing that really comes to mind. I also think that, um, um, you know, we're all fallen, we all make mistakes. So there, there, will, there will always be fellow colleagues that might be a little difficult. And it's just sort of, it's sort of deciding what am I gonna focus on? Am I going to keep focusing on the negative thing that happened or am I gonna focus on all the good that is here? Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I think, 
I think um, I think Steve Jobs once said so taking so exiting the Catholic mindset for a sec. I think Steve Jobs once said, you know, if you wake up, I forget how many times it was, three or four times at a job and you're miserable three days in a row, rethink whether that job is the right job for you. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So so in terms of suffering, I'm not trying to say like, don't listen to your heart. Like if you like if, if you know, if you really aren't happy in the work because of the work that it is, maybe you should think about something else eventually. But don't. Um, what, but I also I, I would just say um, be ready to sort of offer things up through sort of through a daily offering as well. That's helpful. Um, and maybe that wasn't, is that too, was that too religious event, Chris? Like, no, I think it's perfect. Practical I, or, or, yeah. I think that's, I think that's great. It's, it's tough always. I mean, we don't necessarily need to separate out our faith because that helps us in our, right. in our day-to-day right. lives as well. Um, yeah. And, and I think it is helpful with the practical advice. Um, you don't want to be always doing something that makes you miserable because that will right. affect every aspect of your life. Right. One thing, if I could just say really quickly, um, with the question earlier on networking and stuff, um, you know, a really good book, probably many of you have already read it, but a really good book that gave me really good insights into an authentic way to network is um, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Mm -hmm. Um, So I just totally recommend Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. I think it will help people get a better sense of authentic networking. So great, great book and great recommendation. All right. Well, we are just at 10 now. Um, so let's close off with a prayer. And uh, again, thank you so much to our candidates and participants. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Mother of Divine Grace, pray for us. I always want to say Our Lady of the Annunciation. We've got that tomorrow. Pray for us. <laughs> In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> I don't know how to say that title of Mary. Uh, thank you all so much. God bless you. Thank you so much for being so generous you. with your time. And um, we'll be we'll be praying for praying for everyone as you discern your futures. God bless you. Thank you. Cheers.